have it in the next class, right? Next or whenever uh, we have a free class, right? So today we continue that discussion from the last class. So uh, you know the last class we were discussing about. <laughs> no, it's okay. I'm not using that. Okay? Just you can have a look on those uh, PowerPoint slides that uh, I'm going to put up in the website. It's already there. Have you access those uh, slides? Yes, you can simply download it and see that, right? Yes. Uh, let's have that slides as a review material or like a, a, a handout for you. Okay? So actually the concept is very simple. That what you have to know what exactly this evolution is. Right, uh, what the Darwin have been saying and uh, before Darwin what happened and even Lamarckism, right? So what Lamarck used to say and what we denigrate the Lamarck as Lamarckism, right? Inheritance of factory characters, right? That's what Lamarckism is. And much before is essentialism, right? So coming to that, we were, you know, last class we were saying some philosophical issues post-Darwinism. So after the Darwin, uh, in his landmark, book on origin of species by means of natural selection, right? So what are the consequences of that book uh, in a philosophical context? That There are two points that I explained. One is the static universe versus dynamicity. That before that it was not static and the whole world created in a few days time, right? But after the publication of that book, uh, you know, entire philosophy have changed that the nature is dynamic, that everything is changing day by day, right? nothing is static and evolution is a changing process and rather than the creation of course that is just one time at ago six days the whole world is created and then remains the entire world static that was one debate right the another one is the purpose versus function right the function is what more important in for the post-Darwin uh, scientific world even scientists used to say that what is the purpose of so and so what is the purpose of the color of, uh, for example, a black color for the ants, right? Or green snakes. Why do the green snakes have green color? Right? What is the purpose of it? Now that we all say, what is the function of it? But of course, there is yet another, uh, uh, you know, controversy that is mainly theology. You know, those days in uh, like Europe, it's all full of uh, 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 Christian, Christian state, right? The entire Europe, as well as the whole, most of this uh, Western world was. Christian. And you know, there is something called pre Copernican philosophy. What you must be knowing about Copernicus, right? The ancient uh, philosophy of Copernicus. Before Copernicus, everybody thought that, well, Earth is the center of the universe. Everything is revolving around the Earth. Because we are living in Earth, okay, we are very much biased that, well, Earth is the, the champion of the whole universe. And the God is so much kind to make this earth such a peculiar world and the whole universe is inferior to the earth and everyone is revolving around the earth. Earth is the center of the universe. But then the Copernicus came and he disproved everything and that was like a big uh, you know, turning point in the history of science that what Copernicus said is that earth is not a center. The center of our planet system is Sun, you know, that we are just merely one of the planet, nine planets, those days, right? That we are simply revolving around the sun. That was such a, a, a drastic change of concept of the history of science. What the Copernicus have did, uh, said that in his days, right? And something like the the pre the, the Copernicanism, the Darwinism, uh, you know, before the Darwin. You know, the, the champions of the whole life on earth, right? The entire life, we are actually like the top most in the ladder, the evolution is considered the ladder. Even the Lama considered the evolution as the straight line ladder. But human beings are the top of it. Okay? And uh, we are the one who, who are needed uh, descendants of the God. That was the prevailing for that, right? But according to Darwin, we are nothing. We are just a part of the nature that there is no superiority associated with human beings and that is a very big dramatic change in uh, you know in that 19th century philosophers uh, of science and of course the, the, the unassociated fact that what Darwin promulgated is that we are descended from apes right our grandfather great grandfathers were monkey 
So that kind of concept was very revolutionary in that days. Okay, so that is yet another a big change that what Darwin has been doing those days. Is that clear? Now, well, Darwin always thought about the variations. Right, last class we were saying what the variations are and uh, uh, how these variations affect on individual survival, uh, on reproductive survival in a population. Right, and that is why the variations are of paramount importance in, uh, you know, in the world, right, in, in the evolution uh, by means of natural selection. Right, so selection happens on the variation, or the variation gives rise to various different uh, you know individuals with differing capacity for the reproductive survival okay so it, it, it is something like a playground for the evolution to happen so without variation of course no evolution can happen right so what makes this variation that is a very big concept here right so well Darwin was clueless of course right so uh, you know, now we know that this is all about the genes, right? That makes it mutations. Yeah, you told mutations. So mutations makes it uh, a lot of variation. But those days, uh, you know, scientists were unaware about the, the process of mutation or everything about genetics, right? Though uh, works of Vikram Mendel, uh, he was a contemporary of Charles Darwin, but neither of them did not know each other's work. Okay, so that was a problem. So there is a quotation from the Darwin's book, okay, so uh, he was in his autobiography, okay? so what he said is that, why did child often reverts in certain characters to its grandfather or grandmother or much more remote ancestor, why a peculiarity is often transmitted from one sex to both sexes or to one sex alone more commonly but not exclusively to the like sex so he did observe a lot of things right in human beings yeah, of course this is in context with human being so sometimes you might have seen that in your family some characters that your great grandfather had or grandmother had that right now you are having it or some of your uh, you know peers is having that kind of character but exactly that is what the Darwin observed okay so again uh, certain characters are transmitted from mother to daughter and father to son. Most often, this is what the sex link inheritance, of course, that we know now. But this, these kind of things, uh, uh, the Darwin is thinking about it. He is contemplating what would be the mechanisms for this kind of transfer. So, prevailing thought, last class I said, the prevailing thought during the Darwin's time is what blending is, right? Like paint bottles, you are know, mixing these two paint bottles to get a new color. And then, subsequently, any variation rise in them will be diluted, diluted, diluted. Okay, so what Darwin said is about gin and tonic. Okay, so cocktail mixing. Right? If you mix this tonic to the gin for many, many generations, for example, 100 generations, then the, there is no taste of gin there, it's only tonic water. And so that is what the blending. But Darwin never opposed this blending inheritance because that was a prevailing scientific thought, well accepted scientific thought. But Darwin uh, was not courageous enough to disprove that blending is not the right way. That it is, it, it is something else, right? It's not just blending. Works here, right? Then there is this guy called Fleming Jenkins. Okay, so. He was a Scottish engineer, okay, so his name is Fleming Jenkin. What this person did is that uh, he had sent his fifth edition of uh, this book, Original Species, that Darwin has sent for an independent review. Okay, of course, the review is very important for any of the scientific publications, right? Even your papers, you have to send for reviewers if you submit to a journal. Journal will forward your paper to reviewers, right? That is what you call peer review process. So during those days, the peer review, so nature, natural selection by means of, uh, I mean, original species by means of natural selection, that is a Darwin's book, right? So the person who got this book to review is this engineer, okay, this uh, Fleming Jane. So then he published a review of that book, 
in a journal called Northern British Review. Okay? So, in which he absolutely criticized that Darwin's uh, theory of evolution did not work at all in the assumption of uh, you know the mixing of the characters. Okay? So, that is something called swamping error. Okay? That is a term that he referred and it is still uh, very famous, okay? swamping error. So, you can actually have a look in the Wikipedia article or any of these articles on uh, swamping criticism of Darwin. Okay? So, it won't work in the assumption of blending heritage. That was his criticism. To prove that one, he supposed uh, you know, a sexual pair, okay, male and female, had 100 offspring. Okay? So, out of which only one offspring is a wife. Okay? Then, uh, in subsequent, he, then he was speaking about subsequent generations of this one particular offspring which is having certain, you know, now we call mutation. But during his time, he said it's a kind of a sport. Okay? So this sport, there is this variant offspring of this hundred offsprings, is the only offspring that could able to survive and achieve the reproductive age. And then in his subsequent generations. So that sport, that character is diluted. Is that clear? So whatever the character it be, for example, skin color, gradually it is being diluted from first generation, second generation, third generation. Okay. So after many hundred generations, so that character is subsequently too much diluted to an extent that population is getting rid of it. Right? So in that way. It is next to impossible that any kind of these variations can result in survival of the fittest okay? or evolution of these uh, variations that, that could never happen. So Fleming, of course, he was a mathematician uh, as well as an engineer. So he did some mathematical calculations on Darwinian principles. So he modeled the Darwinian evolution and he concluded that it is absolutely erroneous. Okay? So that was his criticism. So then again he did another very interesting uh, though racial, highly racial example that uh, you know in a shipwreck white man arrives in an island of four black men. Okay? Then uh, he said he would kill many blacks in the struggle for existence. Okay? The, the white man will kill many black men in that black island for existence. Okay? Then God. Can anyone believe that the whole island will gradually occur white or even yellow population? Eventually, it's next to impossible, right? The, the whole island is full of black, so how could the entire island be converted to white? In an assumption that the white is superior, so that is why it's racial, right? White is of course it's not superior. So in an assumption that the white is a superior characteristic, that it's a, it, it renders some fitness of those white population to survive. Still, even then, the entire island turning to a white is next to impossible in a blending form of inheritance. Okay? So that is the his criticism, the, the Fleming criticism. Right? Then this guy called Arthur Sladen Davis. Okay, so he is a grammar school mathematics teacher. In Leeds. So he did a letter to Nature, okay, Nature in 1871. Then he refuted the Jenkins calculation. Uh, you know the his calculation, the original calculation of Jenkins. He said that hundred out of hundred offspring, only one offspring survived. So if only one offspring survived, how could he find uh, his mate, his or her mate? So it's next to impossible, right? So at least there should be two individuals have to survive and it has to be male and female otherwise the you know the population is shrinking to an extent that ultimately the population is extinct okay so that is why we pointed out this mistake in Jenkins paper then we did another calculation of uh, this two individuals surviving these two individuals and then what we found is that it will never get lost what are the variations in the population? Even under the blending form of inheritance, variations will never, uh, you know, get rid of in the population. So it will survive in the population. 
So to exemplify it, what he did is that he was saying about cats. Okay, so a population of white cats, where a black cat is in the system, okay? then of course he makes it, then slowly, the next generation will be a little bit of grey cats, right? Then after many, many, many generations, even after 100 generations, the two, the dark two will always, uh, uh, you know, uh, remain in the population. We will never disappear. That white cats will never come back again in that population, even after uh, many, many hundred generations. Okay, so that is why it is. So, uh, the variations, okay, so the variations, I mean, it was pers persist, right? This kind of uh, uh, sport, you can say, or variants can never get rid of, right? So, that was his uh, uh, slated Davis criticism, but still. You know, Fleming's criticism is intact, right? It is still valid that, uh, you know, that's a, a big mistake what uh, Darwin has done in his theory of evolution. But in, uh, uh, the con within the concept of blending evolution, right? So in that concept, you can never justify the Darwin's theory of natural selection, okay? So of course, then uh, particulate inheritance was discovered by you know, Gregor Mendel, right, in his famous work on P, God and P, what he did, you know, I'm not, uh, you know, uh, illustrating exactly what his experiments were, but it's very simple, all the textbook in biology is saying about his work on the green P versus yellow P, the first generation, what he observed is all yellow, then the second generation comes one is to three, right, so those kind of uh, breeding, that is cross breeding experiment on the God and P, he could able to prove that it is, uh, what is being inherited is not blended on, right? It is particulate, it's like particle or atomic. That is what the Gregor Mendel used in his treatise. Okay? Atomic, it's not blended on. Okay? So that is what, in blending heredity as well as mentalinian heredity, the main difference here is that in the mentalinian heredity it is preserved, right? The chromosomes or genes are preserved in first generation to second to third and fourth. But in blending heredity, it's mixed up. So whatever the variation comes in, uh, uh, you know, a fit a variation that confers a population to be, uh, you know, adaptive. Okay, so adaptive variation. Even of even though an adaptive variation arises in a population, that will eventually get lost in blending inheritance. But that survives in, you know, in Mendelian. Is it clear? So that is not actually mixed up. Okay? For example, a white, you know, in a white population, a black, uh, you know, or handsome in person. Okay? Or the white population, one individual is having a mutation of uh, black. And the black color gives that individual some advantage for surviving in that population. Okay? So there is an advantageous mutation, black color of a population full of white. Let it be human being, you know, for example, for the sake of simplicity, you are saying that an island full of white people, but one individual is turned out to be black. Okay, so that, that is a, just a mutation, right? So that, after that mutation, the next generation, and this dark color, skin dark color, is giving certain advantage for the population. That is why the dark color have arisen, okay, for survival benefit. For example, you know, an attacker, or uh, let, let's say that dark color is uh, giving some protection against skin cancer. Melanin in the skin is giving certain protection against skin cancer. Okay? So that black individual survives them. And uh, of course, he mates with a white individual, and then the second generation will be gray, you know. Then the third generation, According to blending inheritance, it will be a little bit lesser gray, right? And then fourth generation will be much lower gray. But then gray color always survives there. But in uh, you know that uh, advantageous mutation is not preserved in that particular population, right? But in the case of you know mentally inheritance fashion, of course the first generation will be gray. 
right? If it is there is no dominant characters, if black and white are both are necessary, none of these characters are dominant, then first generation is going to be a mixture. Great. That is what happens in uh, human beings also, right? In interracial, uh, you know, mating. For example, if uh, you know, uh, yeah, in uh, US you can say, right? White men uh, marrying a uh, you know black woman, Negro woman, and then the first generation is going to be kind of a gray, right? Gray kind or yellow, you can say. Then this individual mating with another gray individual, for example or a, a yellow individual, then the next generation is it going to be a kind of a little bit more grayish or more yellowish? No, that is not the case, right? Next next one, next uh, generation is going to be going back to, reverting back to their ancestors. So it's going to be black and white. Right? That is a very interesting phenomenon uh, that you can see that in uh, human beings also. So that is because of the particular elements. Okay, so that is why uh, to say that Darwin's selection works, it needs to be, inheritance needs to be particular or atomic. Exactly. Otherwise the good uh, variants are eventually lost from a population. So those good individuals, so individuals giving certain advantage for the survival of the population needs to be survived and to survive it you need to have a pattern of inheritance that actually, uh, you know, contribute to the survival of that particular variation. Is that clear? So, then the Darwin, you know, he was, he did acknowledge that he is not good in mathematics. And he, you know, algebra had always been a problem for him in his school days. Right? And uh, even if he pursued mathematics, he would have never gotten good grades in mathematics. So that he did affirmed that in his autobiography that is published long back and then this Jenkins whatever the criticism that this uh, Jenkins uh, put forward was totally based on mathematics with lots of equations that made Darwin quite you know scared of this criticism and finally what Darwin did is that he totally accepted that criticism and he did say that he was flawed okay so then on the fifth edition of the uh, you know, his book, he did incorporate some changes because of this flaw, okay, but that is not actually his mistake, right, so he added this paragraph, or let me read that paragraph, right, this is a new addition to the fifth edition of that, his book on the origin, right, I also, I saw that the preservation in the state of nature of an occasional deviation of structure such as monstrosity, Okay? Deviation, for example, an individual, one of you are turning to be a monster. Okay, so everybody is just normal one. You are turning, one of you are turning to be a monster. Okay, uh, is of course a very rare that if preserved, it will generally be lost by subsequent intercrossing with ordinary individuals. Right? Nevertheless, until reading an able and valuable article in the North British Review, that is by the Fleming's review. I did not appreciate how rarely single variations, whether slight or strongly marked, could be perpetuated. So it's not a variation perpetuated. See, he, he changed that variation to variations. Okay, plural form. So there just one variation will be eventually lost. But you need to have number of variation from number of individuals in a population for that particular variation to survive in a population. Is that clear? So just one, merely one variation cannot be able to change the entire population to another one, but you need to have variations in various, uh, you know, individuals, right? So that is what he saw. So then what he did is that he changed all forms of individual variation, whatever the occurrence of these kind of terms in his book. He changed everything to individual variations. There not just one variation can able to change it, okay? Or any variation, he changed that to any variations. So these are all actually an effect of Fleming's criticism. Okay? But Fleming's criticism is indeed not really valid. Because now we know that the mechanism of inheritance is through 
particulate form, right? It is not blending. So, but to put his book in a constraint of blending inheritance, he needs to do this kind of changes. Otherwise, it's next to impossible, right? The people will not accept his theory because the, as per that blending form of inheritance, that uh, his theory of evolution will not work. Is that clear? Okay. So that is what. Okay. Now, after Darwin, what are the new developments in this field? Right. So there is something called neo Lamarckism. That is a, a very important thing. Right. It's not it's neo Darwinism is something else. It's neo Lamarckism. What Lamarck studies? Well, there's so many good, lot of contributions that Lamarck have done, except uh, especially adaptation, significance of adaptation in the process of evolution. That is the Lamarck's first contribution and most important contribution, right? But he also said that inheritance of acquired characters occurred during an individual's lifetime, and especially due to interaction with the environment. So environment can change certain character, implement. Uh, implement certain characters in an individual that can able to uh, pass on to the subsequent generations. So inheritance of acquired characters, right? So that is what he said. So that particular, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, what, what is that the theory you can say or hypothesis of Lamarck is still being followed by many, uh, you know, evolutionary biologists. Okay. So in one of his one of the uh, you know one historian Peter J. Baller, okay, so he what he said is that one of the most emotionally compelling arguments used by neo Lamarckisms of late 19th century was the claim that the Darwinism was a mechanistic theory, okay, uh, theory uh, which reduced living things to puppets driven by heredity. So we are helpless in nature. Okay. Even if you have a very interesting variation that can able to, uh, you know, uh, of course, if, if some of you are, you know, having a deleterious variation, you are quickly removed out of the population. Then there is no way that people having a bad mutation can able to survive. Right. So the, that means that we are nothing. We are just puppets. We are simply playing in the field of heredity. That we are helpless. Okay. But According to Lamarckism, that gives certain hope that even if you are not uh, suitable to the environment, you can simply go to another environment. So you can survive in that environment. Okay, if you, if you, if for example, if the black color is not selectively advantageous in a in a cold environment, right? So black guys can simply migrate to a hotter environment, and they can they can survive in there. Right? That is. A very interesting uh, feature of the Lamarckism uh, that many of these modern evolution biologists appreciate that this gives certain hope and everybody is after hope, right? We need certain hope So that is, that is why, right? Lamarckism in contrast allows the individual to choose a new habit when faced with an environmental challenge and shape the whole future course of the world. We can change the whole future course of the world by choosing a different environment. So that is what you can do. And then Thomas Wiesman, the famous. Can you say where this Wiesman is from? Yes? Germany. 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 Where, where, where this person is from? Anyone? He is from Israel. And the Israel is renowned for this August Wiesman that uh, Israel's top. Uh, Scientific lab, scientific institution is named after him. It's called Wiesman Institute of Sciences. Okay, so there is there are several Nobel Prize winners from that institute. There is one of the top institutes of uh, scientific research in the world. So Wiesman is the one. So this guy, what he did is uh, he cut the tails of that. Okay, so to say that uh, you know the, the next generation of bats will not inherit the the, the tail. That day. To disprove Lamarckism, right? In a certain degree, he could able to disprove that this Lamarckism is entirely flawed, right? But very interestingly, these days, if you read the literature, Lamarckism is coming back, okay, with much more force. 
and there are several high impact factor journals are uh, publishing papers that are in claim for Damascus. Okay, so I have linked certain papers there. Okay? So it's not by DNA sequence. So normally DNA sequence equates classical genetics, right? The Mendelian inheritance and DNA sequence variations are all same. Right? So of course, classically there is no inheritance of accurate characters, but there is another mechanism. Can anyone just how could a character be inherited to uh, I mean actual character be inherited to next generation? There is another mechanism that is very popular, very popular these days. Any idea? If not genetics, then what? Classical genetics versus what? Any idea? Yeah, it's something called epigenetics. You must be aware of that right? epigenetics is, uh, you know, the gene expression, right? the change in the gene expression values by various mechanisms. And most importantly, it is methylation, right? DNA methylation pattern, as well as histone modification. There are several mechanisms now available, right? So, this, uh, you know, this epigenetic mechanisms are able to inherit. Okay, able to uh, transmit to the offspring, and there are several studies on that uh, level. Okay, so for example, foraging behavior in chicken, the chicken uh, with uh, constantly changing and unpredictable uh, food, unreliable food environment. Okay, so the environment where uh, scarcity is very high, food scarcity is very high. Then these researchers have looked at the uh, immune response of that. Okay, so immune responses of course is changing, right? In an uh, uh, environment with absolutely changing food supply. So resources are scare, scarce resources, sometimes it is abundant. So immune system response is different. So they did the second generation, third generation, fourth generation where these chickens are not subjected to a changing environment, but still they could able to see this immune system responses. So why did how did immune system or the genes calling for immune systems are uh, uh, you know differently expressed even after a generation. Is that clear to you? So that change was first of all first generation it was parted by differential environment. Right? So that change is persisting after one after another generation. But the authors could able to prove that this is because of the methylation pattern that is being transmitted from generation to generation. So that is the proof of inheritance of actual characters. Right? And uh, there are also there are several of these uh, uh, you know, studies. And I get another very interesting study. What these people have done, what uh, uh, a group of Australian researchers. Okay? So what they did is that rats, they did study on rat populations. But male rat were overfed and they became obese. Okay? And then female rats are just normal. And then they are subjected to the mating to see what is happening for the first generation. Okay. So first generation, what they observed is that female rats, I mean baby rats, female baby rats are obese, very interesting find. But male rats are not obese, it's normal. But female rats are become obese. That means some characters of male rat, obese male rat is being inherited to female. Okay. So then Generation after generation they did and they did uh, reproduce this finding in many different institutions in Australia and that is one of the uh, highly cited paper in nature, that's published in nature. Okay? So then the author could able to find the reason for this inheritance of the obese genes. Okay, Ob obesity you can say, it's not actually a gene but expression of genes involved in obesity. Okay? That is because of the methylation pattern, that is being inherited. So I have linked up that paper also. And there are a number of papers coming up these days from Japan as well in rice. There are certain characters in the rice is being inherited. So th those characters were uh, 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 you know imparted by changing environment. Okay, not just in rice but a number of plants. Environment is changed and these changes okay, are being transmitted from generation to generation. So that papers are I'm also going to link up in the website. Go and read that okay? and try to appreciate that the Lamarckism is also something interesting to consider. It's not 
uh, uh, you know, adjunct or non-scientific, but there is something, uh, you know, something about Lamarckism in it, right? So if any of you are in research gate, I post a question there. So let's see what others respond to that question, right? And there is a paper by Hendel, one of the recent papers, it's a review, okay? So what he concludes is epigenetics allows peaceful coexistence of Darwinian and Lamarckian evolution. So coexistence and it is peaceful. So that means that Lamarckism and Darwinism both are involved in evolution. It's not just that Darwinism is involved. And of course, Lamarckism had always been perpetuated and always been supported by French evolutionary biologists for more than 200 years. Because French, you know, they always want to criticize British. The Darwin is a British. And, uh, you know, Lamarck is a French. So it's British versus French rivalry in evolutionary biology thought. But now that it's a re-emergence of Lamarck. Okay? So let's see what will happen in the, in the future. Is it here? Any questions?